extraordinary for me. We did a two-part sermon. Um, we started last Sunday, and we are finishing that two-part this Sunday. So I, I hope nothing is lost on you that was articulated last week. But if it was, we have our sermons up online. And next time you're driving or whatever, you can, um, you can hop on there and listen to that if that would be helpful to you. But today we're doing the second half of this this sermon I've titled, Get to Jesus, Part 2. And I am going to begin simply by reading today's text. That text will be Mark chapter 5, verses 35 through 43. 35 through 43. And if you are able to, out of honor for God's holy word, would you stand as I read this text? Mark 5, 35 through 43, reads like this. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And Jesus saw a commotion people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, Little girl, I say to you, Arise, and immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. May God always bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. You may have a seat. If you're familiar with frontier pioneer history out here, you'll likely know the name I'm about to mention. Not quite out here, a little further east. But John Coulter was part of, mm, mm, was part of the Corps of Discovery with Lewis and Clark and and decided he wanted to stay out west when they, you know, after they went back, he kind of liked it. And he was the first non-native person to see uh, what became Yellowstone National Park. He he was quite the uh, frontiersman. He he was a tough man who lived a tough life, uh, mapping out much of the territory and frontier not too far from here, but he almost met his end one day, likely many days he, he almost met his end, but one day that lives a bit in infamy, he was trapping on the Jefferson River near the headwaters of the Missouri, and his partner and he were called out of their boat by a large group of the Blackfeet. His partner resisted. That was went down in history as a bad choice. He was killed. Coulter was taken, stripped of his belongings and his clothes, and given a three to four hundred yard head start. And he started running. And several hundred of the Blackfeet ran after him. And what has famously become known as Coulter's Run, he ran and he ran until all of the Blackfeet dropped off except one. And that man was gaining on him. When he got close enough, Coulter turned on him and bested the man with his own spear. The rest of the tribe caught up for that representation of the tribe. So he spent the night in the river in a beaver lodge while the tribe looked for him. And then the next morning he started his seven-day naked journey to the nearest fort, which he did reach. And it wasn't until he reached the fort that he knew he would live. Not until then. There was a hot pursuit. He knew where life was, and he did whatever he could, whatever he had to do to reach it. People will do a lot to find life, to preserve life. They'll move. They'll they'll relocate. They'll spend countless dollars on medicine. They might change their lifestyle entirely. Anything to find and preserve life. Now, our story, the one that we are finishing today, is all about finding life. And both of these people, 
the woman from, from last week, and Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, both of them have come to the right place, or rather, they've come to the right man. They've both come to Jesus. They got to him. They found life. So I think it would serve us to review just a bit. Let me review, hopefully, in a, in a helpful way. Remember that what, the, what we just read does not stand on its own. I started with as he was still speaking, and that, that begs the question, what was being said? This little girl being resurrected is part of this larger story that we started last week. So what happened in that first part, hopefully you remember, Jesus had just returned from across the sea where he had carried out this amazing exorcism of demons out of the unbindable man. He left his witness there and he returned to Israel and a huge crowd was around him. They were pressing in and Jairus, the leader of the local synagogue, came to him. Why? Because his own daughter, a 12-year-old girl, was close to dying. And just a quick reminder about this man, Jairus, he is a significant public figure. People know him. They look to him. It, it was likely very scandalous for a religious official to come and publicly throw himself at the mercy of this controversial man named Jesus. It would have been a bold statement, but he did. He came in his neediness, in his humility, and in faith. Come, lay your hands on my daughter, and she will live. And Jesus goes with him. Great. The, the one who can give life, uh, the one who can restore is coming with me. Things are looking up. A bit of good news. There is hope for my daughter until, you remember... The journey to Jairus' home stops because there's an interruption. On the way, here comes an unnamed woman. She has been losing blood for 12 years. She has an incurable condition. She has spent all of her money. No doctors have been able to help her. She is desperate, like Jairus, she is desperate. And she is convinced that if she can just touch the clothes that Jesus is wearing, that she will be healed. And she was right. So power went out from Jesus. She was healed in an instant. And she came and confessed and told everything to Jesus, who, rather than condemn her, that was not on his agenda at all. He welcomed her as a daughter, and he commended her faith. It's a wonderful story. Uh, uh, last week, we asked the question, who needs Jesus? And they both did, despite being essentially opposite people in many ways, Jairus and this woman. Jesus is for anyone who would see their need and, and come to him. It's a great story, but it's an unfinished story. And there's a problem, because precious time is being wasted, you could say, from a human standpoint, while Jairus' daughter is dying. In fact, as we just read, messengers showed up right after the woman was healed. Jairus, your daughter is dead. This, this life-giving moment was interrupted by the news of death. You want to talk about a juxtaposition. Now, normally, the story would be over at this point. This person is dead. What more is there to do? Normally it would be over, but here it isn't. The story is not over. So my proposition for you today is this. Get to Jesus because he brings life. Get to Jesus because he brings life. We, we, we get to Jesus not because he gives us stuff, not because he gives us temporary happiness or, or um, shallow pleasures, but because Jesus brings life itself. That's why we must get to Jesus. He speaks into our lacking existence and he restores. Um, don't have the wrong idea about Jesus. Some, some folks think that Jesus will give them an earthly happiness based on health or based on wealth. Or maybe he'll give me some kind of, I don't know, inner peace. Or, or he'll help me get in touch with myself. Wouldn't that be something? That, that's his purpose. That's what he does. Now, those things are all so minuscule. They're minuscule compared to what Jesus is really all about. Jesus is the word of God, John 1. And the word of God always brings life to death. 
light to darkness, hope to hopeless situations. In the case of the woman, the life was, was literally draining out of her day by day. And he restored her life. He reversed that course. And in the case of the girl, even more severe, she is actually dead. And Jesus brings life to her. There's been, if you've been attending for a while, there's been an escalation in these recent uh, stories with Jesus. He proved his dominion over the chaos of the world when he calmed the storm. He spoke to the storm and rebuked it. Then he proved his dominion over the demonic, these historic, ages-old enemies of God, by saving the man in the Decapolis. Uh, so things got a little bit more intense. Next, he cured an incurable disease, leaving doctors scratching their heads, showing his dominion over decay and his dominion over illness. And here, he proves his dominion over death itself, the greatest enemy. Get to Jesus because he brings life. Now, this text should give us some hope. I know some of us are feeling hopeless. I know we are hopeless about different aspects of life, hopeless about maybe others and their standing with God, hopeless about what God is, is doing in the world, hopeless about relationships. But Jesus, our Savior, brings life, and that is always relevant to every situation. So let's get to him today. Even if you've been a Christian for decades, can we come to Jesus again? Let's get to Jesus today. I have several observations I want to make. The first is this. Jesus brings life according to his promises. Let me just reread to you. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and and John, people, people in this scene, they're, like, they're still processing what had just happened. And they should be. Th this woman has been healed when before she couldn't have been healed by any doctor. So this is a marvelous thing. So Jairus is no doubt eager to get Jesus to his house. And wouldn't you be too? Every minute counts at this point. Death is on the doorstep. But now Jesus has healed this woman. Good. And, and we can continue. We can continue on home, but here come messengers from the house. And, and no doubt, no doubt when Jairus saw them, he already knew. Why else would they be coming here if there wasn't bad news to deliver? Your daughter is dead. This changes the tone of the scene, doesn't it? It's too late. She's gone. What, why trouble the teacher any further? We, we tried, Jairus. You tried. It just didn't work out. You didn't get to Jesus in time. This woman coming in, she wasn't part of the plan. Who, who could have planned for this? Now, for, again, for most people, the story ends here. We, we, we did what we could. Death came as it does to all. Now it's time to grieve. So let, let's leave Jesus alone. I'm sure he's got plenty going on. Now, Jesus overheard what they said. And he comes to a different conclusion than they do. Uh, he offers a second opinion, you might say. He, he hears their assessment of the situation, and he promptly ignores it. I like that he doesn't even speak to the messengers. He ignores it, and he overrules it. He gets Jairus' attention, looks him in the eye, and says, No, do not fear. Only believe. Jesus, didn't, didn't you hear what they said? She has died. She's gone. Well, not for long she isn't. Let, let's get home, Jairus. But plans have not changed. Let's get going. Now, now what is going on here? Certainly, Jesus uh, is, is fully God. His full divinity is on display. God can heal. God can raise the dead, of course. But also consider that, that Jesus doesn't miss a beat and consider why he presses on to Jairus' home. Do not fear, he says, only believe, which begs the question, believe what? Believe that Jesus will finish what he has started. He, he will finish what he starts. Remember how this story began. 
Jairus came to Jesus, he worshipped at his feet, and he implored him earnestly, please come heal my daughter. And verse 24 says, and he, he being Jesus, and he went with him. Jesus said, okay, let's go. I, I, I'm in. I will do it. So, so when the woman came to Jesus and the journey uh, was temporarily interrupted, you could think, oh, Jesus forgot. Or, or Jesus took on a new priority, or he is abandoned, decided it's too much. He's abandoned what he said he would do. You know how it is. Oh boy, something came up, and I just, couldn't, I just couldn't follow through. No, no. He finishes with the woman, and then he turns to Jairus and says, now where were we? We're going to finish this. But she's dead. Minor detail. Seriously, minor detail. I said I would come to your house and save her, and that is exactly what I am going to do. Amen. Jesus always acts according to his promises. He doesn't abandon the mission. He doesn't jump ship. And it seems like Jairus knew this. It seems like he does. The messengers from the house thought the story was over. That's clear. Jesus knew it wasn't over, but what about Jairus? His silence, I believe, speaks loudly. He doesn't challenge the Lord. He doesn't sulk. He isn't reactionary. The messengers don't have the last word. Jesus has the last word. Jairus didn't complain when the woman arrived. As far as we can tell, even, he didn't tap his foot or look at his watch. It seems like he really did trust Jesus. He said he'd heal her. He will heal her. There's an excellent testament to faith here uh, coming from Jairus. This is a testament to believing that Jesus will do exactly what he has promised to do. Occasionally, that might be getting less and less, but occasionally you can still find a good lesson in children's books. Let me quote from the uh, world-changing work, Horton Hatches the Egg. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. Anybody? An elephant's faithful 100%. Write that down. (laughs) Jesus brings life according to his promises. Of course he will heal the girl. Of course he will raise her. Now here we are dealing with a physical resurrection from the dead, and we will come back to that in the last point. But this text is for us in our Christian lives right now because the Bible says all of Scripture is for us in our Christian lives right now. So here is a question that is begged. What has God promised that you need to believe? What has God promised that you need to believe? And you say, wait a minute, what promises? God hasn't made any promises to me. If God had come and made a promise to me, I think I would have remembered that. Hasn't he? Hasn't he? Hasn't God made any promises to you? Let let me take a moment to remind you of several, and this is several, several promises that God has made to you. Are you ready? Here's a few of them. The seed of the woman will have victory over the seed of the serpent. Genesis 3. All nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham's descendants. Genesis 13. A prophet greater than Moses would come to lead God's people. Deuteronomy 18. A child would be born on whose shoulders the government will not only rest but continually increase. Isaiah 9. The day will come when God alone will be exalted. Isaiah 2. There will be an end of sin and death, 1 Corinthians 15. The dry bones will live and the law will be written on the hearts of God's people and they will be able to obey, Ezekiel 36 and 37. Jesus will build his church, Matthew 16. Saints will be sanctified and glorified, Romans 8. There will be a resurrection, John 11. There will be justice and peace in the new heavens and the new earth, Revelation 21. He will never leave us, Matthew 28. He will sustain his people, Psalm 55. He will grant us peace to supplant our anxious worry, Philippians 4. Whatever happens, Jesus will never let go of me, John 6. There's there's many more. Time does not allow. 
let, let me summarize. The story of history is one of God making promises and then God following through on them. Th that is the story of time. That is the story of reality and existence. What has God said that you need to believe? And how might it change your day-to-day -day life if you believed, if we believed what God has already said? Food for thought, I hope. Read and believe. Read and believe the promises of God. Because Jesus acts and he brings life according to his promises. Secondly, Jesus brings life personally. Now, when Jesus brings life, he does not do so in a way that is haphazard. He does not uh, do so in a way that is random. Um, he always does so personally. He did so with this woman, and he does so now with this little girl. So speaking, speaking of the woman and the girl, again, just, just excellent orchestration on God's part. We are meant to connect these stories. We're meant to connect these two characters and to see them as similar and different in some ways, but this is a good time to, to point out the connections between them. I mentioned one of them last week. The woman had her incurable bleeding condition for 12 years. The little girl was 12 years old. That means that around the same time that Jairus was celebrating the birth of his daughter, this woman was confronted by fear and dread for what may lie ahead, and she began her decline. Same time, same amount of time. Both are at the complete mercy of Jesus, which is obvious, that, that's plain. But both are called daughter, and I think that's interesting as well. My little daughter is at the point of death, Jairus said in verse 23. And once the woman is healed, Jesus says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. So, so we see these two as very similar, but one thing we must see is that whether we're dealing with this woman or with this little girl, both interactions with Jesus are specific to each person. Um, Jesus meets both right where they are, and he deals with them on a personal level. The woman was in public. The girl was in private because that's where they were, Be because that's where they were. This woman wanted to sneak in. She wanted to steal a little bit of power from Jesus. And he didn't say, well, that's, that's fine. I'm glad somebody got healed. I'll let it slide. He said, no, who? Which person? Who touched me? I want to know who. I want a face. I want a name. Give, give me an actual person so I can look her in the eye, so I can minister to her as my daughter. With the girl, Jesus was equally as personal. He went with her father to her house, into her room. He took her hand and spoke to her body and soul. He cared for her on a personal level. Th this is why, actually, he drove out the crying people. The crying people are an interesting, almost comedic relief here. Let me explain. Verse 38, they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion. That's not, that's not a respectful word. Just FYI, people weeping and wailing loudly. Boy, those people got there quick. Who were they and why do they matter? Um, these were certainly hired mourners, uh, which was a thing and is a thing still in some places. They were on the clock. You can, we got an 11 o'clock, you know, this, this girl's declining, okay, Put on your black suit. Let's get there, whatever. But they were, they were already in place. They were ready to mourn when she died. And like I said, this is a profession that still exists today in some, in some areas. They, they come in to help grieve. And when they do this, they're dramatic. They cause a commotion, weeping and wailing loudly. Uh, um, these were the folks who took theater in high school but who weren't good enough to get into local commercials. <laughs> they, they, they were obnoxious. I mean, the text indicates that. They really were. And verses 39 and 40 say this. When they had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead but sleeping. I think there's a little bit of provocation on Jesus' part there. It's excellent. And they laughed at him. And he put them all outside. And he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Jesus kicks them out. Isn't that mean? No, they were not sincere. 
They, they were not. These were not sincere people. We know they were not sincere. That's not my speculation. We know they were not sincere because they go from wailing to laughing and mocking on a dime. They, they, some translations say, and it's very accurate, they laugh Jesus to scorn. So they have no, they have no part in what's about, something amazing is about to happen, and they have no part in it. Jesus gets everyone out of the house except the parents and his closest three, Peter, James, and John, very interestingly, and I think part of why he got them out too, and this is, this is reminiscent of, of several biblical texts, very interestingly, there are only two other times, you, you may know them, when Jesus takes just these closest three with him. The Mount of Transfiguration, which is very reminiscent to Sinai, we'll, we'll get there, and into Gethsemane a very important, crucial time in the ministry, a very intimate time, and he takes his closest three. So uh, just like the common people could not even touch the foot of the mountain, these people who shouldn't even be here, who aren't sincere, they got to go. You know, get them out. They can wait outside. The two important moments I mentioned, transfiguration in Gethsemane and with this one, where Jesus raises a dead girl to life, God works... God works with very large numbers of people. That's absolutely true. Uh, uh, God deals with people on a corporate level. Scripture talks about God dealing with nations, cities, and individual churches, uh, groups of people. But He also knows your name. He also knows your name, my name. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. John 10. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands, Isaiah 49. You have kept count of my tossings. You've put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Psalm 56, verse 8. Read through your Bible and you see a God who, who knows people and who meets people with his grace right in the midst of their lives. He, he, he does this for us. He does this for us. Not after we clean ourselves up, we don't do that. We're not in the business of cleaning ourselves up. We never would. We never could. He meets us right where we are. That is where new life is given, right where you are. Think of where you were when God's grace and Christ interfered with you. We, we, we were probably in a myriad of different places, each of us who are in Christ. Think of it. It's always personalized to the one being saved. And so we don't expect total uniformity in every way when we see people receiving the grace of God and coming into his family, we come from different places, but always, but always to the same Christ. Um, God meets us where we are, but he does not leave us there. So lastly, Jesus brings life with eternity in view. He brings life with eternity in view that uh, ends like this. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. She was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, told them to give her something to eat. Jesus spoke to her in Aramaic. That was the common language. And he issued a command. I just I want to be clear about what's happening here. I, this, again, off the top of my head here, always dangerous. But when, I, I mean, when I'm waking up one of my kids, it's usually a, a gentle hey, you know, time to wake up, you know, slept long enough. What do you think, bud? You know, da, 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 da. This is a command. This is a command of the author of life speaking to one in the realm of death and, and calling her back. This is a command, and the girl obeyed. There, there was no other option but to obey. There was no, I'm fine, Jesus, but thank you for offering there was none of that. She obeyed because she must obey the command of the Lord. The God of the universe was the one speaking, and she hopped too. It's kind of like Lazarus. I don't think he had to think about it. He was given the command, and he obeyed. It happened immediately. It wasn't a gradual recovery. Immediately she got up, she stood up, she got out of bed, and she was functioning completely normally. She was given something to eat. I, both because I guess dying really takes it out of you, I suppose. Um, so she, she was likely hung, physically hungry and needing nourishment, but it was also done as a proof because if I could make a very simple statement, only living things eat. 
so th- this is this is this is no artifice. This is no mirage. This is uh, this is a actually hungry living girl who a moment ago was dead. Uh, really, this is reminiscent of Jesus after his own resurrection on the lake shore, cooking and eating fish. Now, in one of the greatest understatements ever, and then. There's a few of them in Scripture. They are great understatements. They were overcome with amazement. That that means they lost control because of their amazement. I mean, who knows what kind of noises they were making. I mean, it it was a scene. Why? Why were they overcome with amazement? Because in this world, dead things usually stay dead. That's the norm, right? Death spread to all men, Romans 5. Things are born, and then they begin, the moment they're born, they begin that long process of dying. Death is destructive. Death is sad. Death is a travesty. Death is an enemy of God and his people. But in this scene, the one, the only one with power over death is in the room. And that's really good news for this little girl. Now, here's the reality. Here. Her resurrection was certainly joyful, but guess what? She would die again. Maybe six, seven, maybe eight decades later. But this little girl in the story, she's dead right now. Okay? Her parents are dead right now. Those hired criers are dead. The woman with the incurable bleeding condition is dead. Peter, James, and John are dead. They are all dead, but Jesus is not dead. I just, we have to, there are two categories of living things in this universe. Those that are dead and those that are, or will die and those that have conquered death. And Jesus is the only one in that category. Jesus is not dead. Same John who was there for this resurrection also was witness to the resurrection of the Christ. And on the island of Patmos in Revelation 1, 17, he says this about his friend, and his Savior, and his God, Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Church, please hear this. The point of this text is not, it is not this, It is not that Jesus will definitely heal your sickness or that he will absolutely raise your loved one from the dead in this life if you have enough faith. Miracles happen, yes, but the point of this text is that people were made for life eternal. That's the point here. Sin hindered that, but God, through Christ, has had victory over sin. He has won the decisive battle over death. Jesus himself, Jesus himself, the one who took this girl's hand and brought her back into life, he entered the grave on behalf of others, and he emerged unscathed. He alone. He is alive now and forevermore, and all who trust in him will be raised unto eternal life with him for an eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. So so this girl being raised, and just in that one moment, is not the punchline. This girl being raised is just a glimpse, just just a glimpse of what is coming for God's people. That's where it sets our minds and our hearts. It forces us to consider eternity. This girl came back from the grave. Wouldn't it be great if I could too? Yes, you can. And if you are in Christ, you will. Let this text point you somewhere. Death, death will not have the final say. Jesus has had the final say. And he has declared death to be obsolete. And he's going to destroy it. Jesus' mission was not simply to heal a handful of people or even uh, to resurrect a handful of people, just buying them a few more decades of time. That was, not, that was not the end game. Hey, it's not much, but it's the best I can do. Enjoy a few more years of life. No, no. Jesus came and performed wonderful miracles and signs, and they all revealed who he is, and they pointed to his eternal intentions. 
I was thinking of how to work this next passage into the sermon, and I'm just going to read it. So there you go. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. Just be, just be overcome with amazement at the truth I'm about to read. I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Do you live like Jesus really will finish what he has started? He really will raise us to life unending. This is happening just like he kept his promise to Jairus, he will resurrect his people to life forevermore in real bodies, in a real place, with no sin, with no suffering, with no death. That's coming. It has been promised. Do we live today with eternity in view? Is that always on the front of our minds? Do we treat every day as if eternity is on the horizon? Because it is. And if our eternity is on the horizon... Translate that back to right here, right now. If eternity really is coming, how does that inform my life spent here? If, if, if that's true, what does that mean for me today? What does that mean for um, my, my words? What does that mean for my relationships? What does that mean for knowing God and His Word? How does eternity and the promise of eternal life, how does that affect how I talk to my spouse? How does that affect how I raise my kids? How does that affect how I engage with my neighbors or my brothers and sisters in Christ in this room? How does eternity inform those things? What room is there? What room is there for deep bitterness, knowing that glory is coming? What room is there? How, how, how can I live in hatred while anticipating bliss with the God who has befriended me? How will I interact with unbelievers knowing that eternity is real and where they stand now, they have no part in it? A church, we ought to be just like the people in that room. When that girl opened her eyes, we ought to be just like them. Overcome, and I don't mean this as a one-time thing, continually overcome with amazement that Jesus raises the dead to life. He forgives them their sins and he calls them his own overwhelmed at the one who brings life. So may Jesus and his life-giving work always overwhelm us every day in every place until eternity is here. Let's pray together. God in heaven, we, we know that you have brought life through Christ and through Christ alone. There is no other name uh, among men uh, given uh, that by which we must be saved. Um, in Christ alone, as we sang. God, my prayer f foremost is that everyone here would know that and would believe it. And God, would you impress that truth on our hearts so deeply that we live in that reality, that Christ has conquered the grave, that eternity is coming, um, and that we look forward to the glorious resurrection and the new heavens and the new earth. And I ask that we would live according to those promises. I pray we would be a people who love uh, uh, to talk about eternity and talk about the eternal implications of how we live our lives today. So, God, would you please use this truth and truths like it to shape the culture of this church, to shape our hearts, Lord. Um, we need your help. 
Lord, we get so distracted and so uh, bogged down with the here and now. At times, eternity slips out of our view. It shouldn't. Uh, please help always overwhelmed, always overcome with amazement, God, at who you are and what you've done for people now and forevermore. I ask this for the good of people, and I ask this for your glory, God in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.